roof of the gold sands is raised. Everyone here knows what that could mean to this football. Hello guys and welcome to the latest in the Press Pass series on Back of the Net where we speak to pundits, journalists and broadcasters who can give us an insight into all things football and quite often with an AFC Bournemouth slant as well. Uh, now we're really excited about the return of the football season and once again we're going to be there at full time with the free-for-alls, trying to cover the match with as much depth as we possibly can. So after the final whistle, you know where to come. We're live on Facebook and YouTube, and we're going to be doing that for every match we cannot attend. So make sure you press the subscribe button uh, because we'd love to have you on after the Blackburn match. Now, uh, first and foremost, I would uh, like to introduce a face that doesn't need an introduction. Jeff Hayward. Jeff, how are you? Yeah, very good. Looking forward to the new season like you, Sam. Can't wait. And you're looking forward to it. It makes a change, doesn't it, eh? It's weird, you know. It feels like it's only just ended and that was a really depressing end to the season. But uh, full of optimism, especially after banging in five goals at uh, West Ham last week. Much, much more optimistic. Yeah, although they were a poor West Ham, weren't they? So how more much we can read into it? Don't know, don't know. No, it was, it, it was the reserves of West Ham's reserves by the looks of things. Yeah, well, we scored five against West Ham and one of the people that we've got in tonight, although he's not here yet, is a player that scored many a goal for Bournemouth between 1988 and 1991. He scored 56 goals in 121 appearances and as well as playing for AC Milan, he most notably played for Watford in three different spells. He scored around 150 goals for the Hornets. He's also an England international and played for the under-21s before claiming... 14, cap to the full side as well, scoring three goals in the process. More recently, he's doing a lot of TV work and quite often can be seen on the box covering football all over the globe. It's Luther Blissett and he's going to be with us very shortly. Now with Luther tonight, we have a commentator who has been at Dean Court many a time to... Well, he's narrated goals from Callum Wilson, Ryan Fraser and many others. But with those two gone... Which players are going to be passing his lips as the ball hits the back of the net this season? Well, whilst he mainly covers the Premier League with Premier League productions, you'll also uh, hear and sometimes see him on Sky Sports 2. And he's got plenty of experience voicing matches for the EFL, MLS, La Liga, international football too. And not many people this. He also lives in Bournemouth as well. It is Gary Taphouse. Gary, how are you? Hi. Yeah, no, really good. Really good. Thank you. Again, really looking forward to the new season. I wouldn't say buzzing because, you know, fans aren't going to be there. And that is, you know, that's what football's all about. So I, as soon as they're back, I'm going to be buzzing. But obviously, you know, it, it is my job. So I'm looking forward to it starting again on Saturday. And I'm loving the fact you've got an actual mic as well. Now, Luther yeah. Blissett is, um, is actually with us. So uh, we're going to bring him in as well. Luther, how are you, buddy? You all right? Why is it you're in the show. Everyone can, see you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we Yay! can. Anyone, everyone? Yeah, hi. How are you? Hi, Luther. Microphone. Yeah, we, he, he perhaps can't hear us <laughs> at the moment, or can he? Luther, can you hear us okay? Well, I tell you what, um, he might need to turn the volume up, so hopefully he'll be able to catch us uh, very shortly. We might just ping him a quick uh, a message. If, Jeff, you can maybe send a, um, a message in the background just to tell him to turn his volume up and hopefully all will be good. Well, in this show, we're going to be talking about the championship challenge that will await AFC Bournemouth. And with one day to go in every, until everything uh, kicks off in the EFL, of course, Watford are playing tomorrow, um, we're going to use this 45 minutes or so to find out our guests' opinions of the second tier this season and to find out their hot tips for promotion. Plus, we'll discuss anything and pretty much everything that you may wish to comment on as well. So pop any questions in the chat box and we'll certainly uh, try to keep an eye on them during the show. And also, uh, we just wanted to point you towards our fundraiser for the Forest Home Hospice, which is still running. Uh, whilst we're just wrapping the fundraiser up, we're keen to give one last push to a charity that does so much for people who are at the end of their lives and in palliative care. There's going to be more information at the end of the show for that. So, uh, Luther, we're hoping you can hear us okay? I can indeed. It is a pleasure to have a goal-scoring hero on the show. How are you, sir? I'm oh, very good. Very good indeed. Really pleased to be uh, around the black and red again. 
<laughs> Good man. And uh, well, Letha, I'll tell you what, we'll start with you. Um, as a person who's got more than a passing interest in AFC Bournemouth and Watford, yeah. last season must have been a nightmare season for you. It was hideous, really awful. And I think what made it what made it really worse was the problems that uh, AFC Bournemouth were having mm. with injuries and all that. I think that really compounded the, the issue of you guys getting relegated because my feeling on it was, had you not had the problem, especially losing pretty much every every member of your back four at, at some stage of the season, you probably would have been okay with that. And mm. some of the performances at the very end, I was keeping my finger at Man City. I just keeping my fingers crossed that you guys would have got that goal back. I'm telling you, because if you had that, you would have been all right. And yeah, it was it was an awful season with what went on at Vicarage Road and. Obviously, the two clubs that came up together went down together. Yeah, it was awful. Just one of the worst possible things that could happen. It must be, Luther, like a real split personality situation because you've got Watford who changed their manager every week and we kept ours for the, for like 13 years. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? It's, it, yeah, it's one of those, you know, how do you, uh, how do you square that circle for one? It's, um, it, it's an odd one. You don't, it's not something that I, I've, I've really got used to because I think if you're going to have faith in somebody and, and say you're the one that is going to pick the team and do it, you've got to let them get on with the job. And um, Watford really, you know, trigger happy, it seems, with changing, uh, changing managers or coaches when, you know, when they think it's, you know, things are not going exactly the way they want to. So it's a bit difficult to get my head around and I still haven't, it's not something that I particularly like because I think the people in charge, they need to be given every opportunity to be successful and if they're forever thinking I could be gone tomorrow, that's not a good thing because the players I feel sometimes can get that feeling and uh, the player, players don't believe that the coach is going to be around next week, he's only here for a short period of time. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get that level of consistent performance. Mm. I mean, whilst the league table, Luther, didn't necessarily lie, do you somehow get the feeling that, you know, your two clubs possibly got related at the expense of teams that weren't as good? I know it's a funny thing to say, but I saw a tweet from Watford today with a look at their squad for this season, and it looks incredible. And I just, and I just think to myself, how can they not be challenging? Some of those names there, and yeah, you know, many of which were there last season. Yeah, but I think the first thing you ask is, why did that squad of players get relegated? That's mm. the best. That's the that's the first and most important question. You know, that squad of players. You look at it on paper, and people say, "Wow, that you know they should um you know they should be challenging in the Premier League," and yet they went down in the end with a bit of a whimper in the end, rather than you know all guns blazing. And that is something that needs to be solved because. You look at the names and you think, how and why? And there's got to be something more to it than that. So hopefully with what I saw against Tottenham, when they had certain of their senior players were missing, the more regulars were missing, and yet there seemed to be a bit of a, a, a bit of a team effort there from all of them. And they were fighting for each other and obviously to impress the new coach. So hopefully that's something they can continue. They did, um, did you see on Sky when they did the... Um, they, they had that uh, poll yesterday of the three teams. Who do they think is more likely to come straight back? Mm. And when it started, the Watford one went for 100% because all the Watford supporters went on straight away. And, went, it's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> and then as, as the Bournemouth fans and the Norwich fans came, it was sort of required. But Watford was still well, well out in front when I, when I stopped looking. And I'm hoping that is not um, going to be something that conjures up um, complacency in, in the fans more than the players that they're going to come straight back because I think we all know that championship is one hell of a division to get out of so uh, yeah it's it, it, there's a lot of work to be done um, I mean from 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 my perspective looking at um, what's going on at Bournemouth how how was the how is the pre-season very short pre-season how has that, that gone and what's the feeling that all of you get from the way things are at the moment uh, at the base. Well, the, the two games that uh, that there have been, we played away at Benfica, went down 2-1, played OK, um, but uh, then played what I called the reserves of West Ham's reserves and beat them 5-3. 
So, you know, it's, it's difficult to read too much into it. The, the, the team seem to be playing with a bit more freedom. They seem to be enjoying themselves a bit more. And there was a bit more fluidity about the shape, which I think last season under Eddie, it all got a bit static at times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but Gary, you you probably saw a lot of the club last season. I don't. Did you see? Did you see those preseason games? I watched the West Ham game. Yeah, they have been very impressive. West Ham were incredibly poor, weren't they? Um, but yeah, there were, I thought there was a lot of positives there um, for Bournemouth. And and I look at you know Bournemouth's team, you know, going into the new season, yeah. and you know the, the the first eleven we could probably all pick it right now. Um, I think we'd probably all come up with probably the same team. Um, off the top of my head, Travers, Smith, um, Cook, Mepham, Rico, Brooks, Billing, Lerma, Dan Juma, Surridge, Solanke. That's probably going to be close to the team, isn't it? Um, hang, on, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Gary. Lloyd <laughs> Kelly. Lloyd Kelly. Come on, the new Nathan. Okay, Nathan. Lloyd oh. Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah. But, you know, that team should be good enough for the championship. Yeah. But the, the question is, is is the squad below that? Because we all know that team can't play two or three games every single week. Yeah. And the championship is just so brutal. That's um, what is, there, is, is the rest of the squad up to that? I don't know. That's going to be yeah. the question. And that, that's why I still think there's going to be movement in, in the transfer window. Yeah, I think that was going to be my question. Because I was going through the fixtures um, the other day. And it literally looks like every three days you're having to put a team out. Um, injuries are going to play a part. Then there's uh, there's going to be maybe what the odd player or whatever you know get uh, you know suspension going to come into it at some stage with bookings because that's the nature of what the, what goes on in the championship. It's not having the having the squad deep enough. I believe will be the key to whether Bournemouth get back up or Watford get back up or even Norwich come up. If we don't, so if they don't have a squad deep enough, or you get the misfortune. Of having lots of injuries, and fingers crossed, you've had all of yours last season in probably the toughest mm-hmm. division ever. So if, if that is the case, and you can avoid the injuries and losing key players at key times in the season, which stops you building that momentum, because we all know once you do get that momentum going, you can weather the storm much easier if, if you're going to do that. So I think that's going to be a crucial part. And from Watford's point of view, if they if they can score the goals that they haven't been able to, that gives them a chance. But I think the difference is you had problems with scoring goals last year. Now you've lost Callum yeah. Wilson, whatever, and, uh, and Fraser you've lost as well. Have you got enough that can get that momentum going so you can build on that and keep going? That, that's, yeah. that, that for me is the crucial thing when the season starts because you know, you're into games, as I say, every three days you're almost playing a game and that goes on. That's... That goes all the way to the end of the season. What do yeah. you think, Sam? Yeah. Where do you think our goal is going to come from, Sam? You, you normally stay well, quiet. Oh uh, yeah, I just think um, you know the way we're playing with a different formation against West Ham. It's the first time we've done a three-four-three, whereby it's worked because when we play three-four-three, uh, it, it it usually turns into a flat back five. But this time, we um, Adam Smith and Jack Stacey worked really well together on each flank, and they complemented Dan Junior and Stanislas that worked behind uh, Dom Solanke. And I I was really excited to see that, but I can't get away from the fact that it was a poor West Ham. Um, so I, you know, I don't really know how much you can sort of um, read into these things. And in terms of our relegation last season, if, if, for me, my only crumb of comfort is that it happened in a season where it didn't really feel like it was football anymore anyway, with VAR and obviously the break with, you know, coronavirus. And as a commentator, Gary, um, obviously you did um, a number of matches uh, during Project Restart and it's going to be the same for you when you go back. Have you have you got used to the way things are now, being in a, in a well, basically like an empty stadium? I don't like it. I mean, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm used to it. But um, yeah, the first game I did back was the, the Bournemouth Palace game. And, um, you know, turning up, it was just very, very strange. The fact that uh, we're in this amber zone, very strict about where we can and can't go. Um, very, obviously, a sterile environment in, in every sense. Temperature checked two or three times. Constant hand washing, masks um, all the time, unless you're commentating. Um, and obviously, you know, no atmosphere whatsoever. And, I, you know, Eddie talked quite a lot about the fact that Bournemouth in particular really missed that because of the nature of the ground. Um, 
which we you know, which I completely agree with. So, you know, as, as I said before, all I'm really looking forward to this season is getting fans back as soon as possible. And, and I, I found all that yesterday extremely depressing that, you know, it all looks like it's going to be put back further and that the test events are going down to a thousand. And it looks like it's further away than ever at the moment. So, yeah, I, I really, really don't like it. I, I'm praying that we get fans back um as soon as possible because so i don't want to get used to it we're lucky in our ears we do actually get the the fifa fake crowd noise in our ears so wow. at, at least we get the impression of being at a normal game so we're talking over that you know um which is just as well because we've got written journos all around us who can hear everything we're saying so um i'd be very conscious of that if i didn't have the crowd noise in my ears but you know that's it's, interesting it, it's yeah. still fake isn't it yeah, it is, and it's it it won't replace the world, uh, the real thing. And that was actually that's actually answered my next question because in my mind, you I'm, I thought you might have to manufacture that feeling of excitement. But if you've got some fan sound in your ear as well, at least you you know you, like you've got the right sort of you know like audible levels in order to sound fairly authentic or as authentic as you can. Yeah, you know, once, you, once you once you start, you, you know you're quite absorbed in the game, and and you don't necessarily think about it while everyone's kicking the ball around. But you know it's it's still fake, and you know of where, where you stand on the gantry, you've got the away fans right next to you. You know a lot of noise comes from there. A lot of noise comes from you know behind the goal on the right. It's just not the same at all. Um, you know, project restarts was one thing. We had to get those fixtures finished. Starting a new season with empty stadiums does feel a bit dispiriting and a bit depressing. Um, you know, I want to take my kids to to games and knowing I won't be able to do that. You know, we're very privileged as commentators to be going to these matches and I'm, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from that. I'm delighted to be doing it. But for me, it's not what football is all about at all because it's all about the fans. I'm a fan of my team. Um, I'm devastated. I can't go and watch them. Um, and, you know, going to matches with no supporters at all, it's it's all a bit depressing if I'm if I'm being really, really honest. Mm. On, on, on that, um, do you think the, the players now will appreciate even more so after this the importance of having spectators there, having their support, even in the times when things aren't going so well and maybe supporters are on their back a little bit. Do you think they will appreciate what the supporters give to the game? Because one thing I've always been been brought up and, and sort of drummed into me, it's all well and good, us as players and the people that run, you know, involved in the, in the club itself from that perspective. But it counts for nothing if people don't want to come in and sit there and watch and voice their opinion and their excitement and that of the game. And I think that's something I'm hoping that players will understand far more. And I think for clubs like Bournemouth and Watford, because we have one or two foreign players at Watford, as you well know, and I think they need to understand that, yes, we may not be Manchester United or your Chelsea or them, but there's something even more special about being representative to play for these people, because these people... Uh, they love you because it's their club and you've got their shirt on and they expect you to put performance in. And it's, it's a slightly different thing rather than playing for all the... Every time you go out and you play for the big club, yeah, you want to play for cups and that sort of thing. But the thing when you play for Bournemouth and you play for Watford, it's the fact that fans are literally right there in the crowd with you. And the fact also that, you know, you're representing them. You're representing each and every fan that supports that club when you walk out in that pitch. And it's not about so much the history of what the club has gone. It's about you doing the best you can for them. And they will support you. If they see that, they will support you to the hill. And they, you know, they will never, ever turn their back on you. Yeah. Well, I'm like you. I'm a bit of a, an old fashioned footballing romantic. And, you know, the, the, the crowd is, is a massive part of it. All I can say is every player I've spoken to, um, both on air and off air has said to me they are desperate to get fans back because you know that, that, that that's what it's all about they're not hearing fake crowd noise in their ears so um it, you know what i would say is i think we we saw players being really really committed even without the supporters um but you know even in post match interviews we saw some pretty blunt answers i'm sure you heard them yourselves from players you know giving four letter word answers when they were asked about what it's like with no fans so um <laughs> yeah. 
you know, we, 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 we want them back as soon as is humanly possible. And let, you know, let's hope we start getting some in October. I mean, I think it's looking less and less likely. And I think what we do, we do know now is that we're not going to get away fans this season, um, right. you know, which is desperately, desperately disappointing. Yes. Uh, Luther, one of the things that um, that is one of the things that connects Watford and Bournemouth, that, that real strong sense of community and the connection the fans have to the, the, the club and the players. I think you as a, a player who's played for both clubs, that's also an important connection. I think also Watford and Bournemouth, we went up together. We've gone down together. You know, we seem like there's this umbilical cord between us at the, at the moment. Do you think... We are both going to go back up together next season. Well, I, I believe that um, both clubs in particular, more than I think Norwich do, I've got a great opportunity here now, as long as the players understand that it's not the Premier League anymore. You're back into where you fight and scrap for every bit of turf that you're going to get. And you cannot afford to not be somewhere near the level that you need to be in the championship because if that is the case that's the day that whoever you're up against will turn you over whether they're at the bottom of the league or in the middle or or anywhere near you the, the, the championship is is just one of the most annoying and most amazing places to play football because everywhere you go you've got a game it is a game regardless of what stage or whatever of a game nobody gives up and i think again going back to foreign players that have come in they cannot really understand that you know, you can't understand that no matter who you're playing, it's going to be like you're playing the Barcelona every week because that is the level that you need to be up against when you go out onto that pitch because nobody gives you anything. And for both clubs, I'm I'm praying that um, that both clubs go back up. Um, but if it doesn't happen, I'm hopeful that one of them does. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I looked at the odds just before we came on air, and um, ah. I don't know if you know who the favourites are to get promoted. Oh, really, um, Gary? What are they? Well, it's Brentford, um, a top oh. with two, uh, two to one. Obviously, playoff um, beaten finalists. Then yeah. it's Watford and uh, Norwich together, and Bournemouth are fourth favourites. Um, but yeah. it's very, very close um, between them all. I mean, you know, they're hedging their bets. Um, before a ball's been kicked, and they're often very, very wrong. I mean, when Norwich got promoted, for example, I think they were like 15th or 16th favourites to get promoted that season. So, you know, we all know the championship is... If you want to go and predict the championship, you're a mug, quite honestly, because <laughs> it's a, it's an absolutely great... I'm lucky enough to commentate on the championship for Sky sometimes. And, I mean, it's a fantastic division because it's so ridiculously unpredictable and everyone can beat everyone else. So, um, but what, what we do know is from, uh, from the last few seasons is it's really important to make a good start. So, yes. you, you know, you, if you're playing catch up early on, then it's going to be very difficult. Indeed. Mm. But it's also the other important thing about the championship is, is how you respond to that setback and the likelihood those setbacks are waiting for you. That trap is set for you pretty much every time you walk out into the pitch in, in the championship because of the nature of, of, of if you catch a team on their best day and you are not on your best day, you know, or anywhere near it, you know, the result can definitely go the other way. So I, I think the the way that you prepare for the, I think the best way is, and I remember Graham saying this was, you have to know how to lose and you have to know how to win and how to prepare yourself for both and how you deal with them afterwards because once it's done you've got to then move on because if you won the game you can't afford to go right it's great and what you need to know that you have to apply yourself exactly the same way as you did to the previous game or even more so and i think mm. that psychological thing in the players heads and the fact that it's going to be coming every two or three days when but these players have not really been used to that yeah they've got a taste of it in this last sort of six weeks when it was done but this is going to be for an entire eight months and it's going to be a very tough time for these players yeah, it's going to be it's going to be very tough for Bournemouth. I mean, our optimism levels were quite high. We always knew that there were going to be players that we would lose. I mean, Nathan Ake, of course, has gone now. Callum Wilson, Ryan Fraser, of course, and you know Josh King looks set to follow at some point soon. But I don't know if you've been in this situation yourself, uh, Luther. But um, what's it like when your teammates around you sort of start to disappear and you don't see any incoming signings? Is it is it something that you've experienced, and would it be a worry for you? 
I, I think yes, I had a little bit of a, a term at Watford um, back in the it's probably a couple of seasons before I came to Bournemouth. It was, and uh, there were certain players leaving, and there were quality players that were leaving, and we never replaced them with players of that same quality. Yeah, we got one or two players in, but the quality wasn't there, and so the performances dipped, and it became, every came became one of those, but you know, it became a scrap. Whereas when I remember games when I was at Bournemouth, let's say, and you've got the likes of Brooks in midfield, and you've got the likes of um, of, uh, of Bishop in midfield, there was four in midfield. For me, I knew because the things we spoke about and the things that I sort of demanded from them in games that there was always going to be an opportunity for me to get a goal. In. There was always going to be one. They're always going to be able to create one for me somewhere. And if they're going to do that, my job is to put the ball in. If you are not sure that you're going to get that because of, for whatever reason, you don't have a, that level of player around you, that can become a problem. It's the moment you start carrying that real goal threat at the opposition, then you have a huge issue because then they, when they stop worrying about you and you saw that, I mean, I've seen it when Watford played the likes of Man City. Because Man City mm -hmm. pretty much after five, ten minutes realised that Watford had nothing really to hurt them with. And then, then you're really under the gun after that because they, they, just, they just forget about the things about the defending they have to do and they just come at you in waves again and again. And eventually, you know, you know once they breach the dam, it's a case of they do it again and again and again and before you know it, you've been absolutely polarised. So it's a, it's, it's a crucial thing that you have players that can deal with the, um, the periods in game when things aren't going well. They need to get together and really stick at whatever the game plan or whatever. And I'm not a big fan of that game plan thing that people talk about. I think it's just a mentality that you have. You know, you go behind and to a man, you look at the person opposite you on the opposite side and you think, I'm going to make sure you don't get a kick again. I'm going to make sure it's going to be tough for you. It's that sort of challenge that you have to do in periods and games to, to get it back. I mean, I look at our midfield this season with Brooks, with uh, Lewis Cook, with yeah. Danjuma, with Lerma, with Billing, they're strong enough. They should be creative enough as well. For me, the concern, having let Callum go and with Josh likely to go, is are we going to actually have somebody who can stick the ball in the back of the net? You Absolutely. had a lot of experience of that, Luther. So, I mean, is that the easy part, you know, sticking it in the net or not? <laughs> well, well, sticking the ball in the back of the net, the first thing is you need players and there are, there are players that naturally find the positions for the creative ones to give them the ball so they can they can do what they do. If you don't have enough of those players that naturally find those positions, because you, you get maybe a couple in a game where you naturally find them, but then you have to be able to work at the person you're playing against. And you quite often have to let players that you're up against, you lull them into a false sense of security to let them believe, right, now they've got you in this area where they're happy with and they think, oh, I'm safe here. You know, you've got to, you've got to, it's that kidology you've got to do and you, you almost have to play that game with them. Like, you know, they can't, they've got you now. And work, but in fact, you've got them where you want them. And because what you've worked with your teammates, you know that you take them and then you use the space that you've left. And I think that is a big thing about goal scorers. They, they know where to be, when to be. And they recognise the players within the team that are able to put the ball into areas that doubles their chances of scoring goals and I think that is a major major thing and Brooks I think is magnificent at it. I think he's I, mm. I, would, I would love to have somebody like that in uh, in my team and be um be get on the end of stuff that he's, he sets up um one of the players that's caused some controversy uh, amongst Bournemouth fans in the last well for a number of months Luther I'm going to push you for an opinion but um I can anticipate that you know I, I can appreciate that you might not want to Ryan Fraser um yep. he's come out and said some strange things in the press as well especially recently um what are your thoughts on him because for Bournemouth fans we're not very happy with him at the moment well I think that's always going to be the case when a player when, when a player you know for whatever reason it was that he's made that decision that he wants to move on because something out there you know you know whether he's a compensation his agent whatever that and he you know he believes that move is there I think regardless of that you you should not, you can't put your boots away because you're still employed at that club. You've still got your teammates, which you've been with for the past 
number of years, you know, through thick and thin, through all the things you've gone through. And you've still got to be there and do your job for them. The only sympathy I have for him is in this last little period, because of the fact that he had that conversation with Eddie and it was a case of, I don't want to get injured now because if I do, then I, what, where do I go from here type thing. I, I can sympathise with players when they get to that, but that's never been my mentality. My mentality is this is where I am until the day that I leave. I'm 100% with them. But that's just the way I am. And that's, that, that's, that's, just, that's just me. But players are different. And he just probably felt that he didn't want to risk picking up an injury if that dream move was going to happen. So in a way, I can see where he's coming from. But putting myself in his position, I'd have put my boots on and done everything I possibly could to keep the team up. Um, because... They're all my. They are my teammates out there. They're my teammates, which I've gone as I said through, you know, through the mud and the rain and whatever weather's chucked at you every day training to be out there to go and try and win a game. And um, for me, that is far more important that the loyalty that you give to those players because they've had your back at times when things haven't been going well. And, you know, you need to be there for them at a time when you all need it. I think if Ryan Fraser thinks that we've battered him for how he's behaved this season. Well, if he behaves like that at Newcastle at any point. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a bit more intense. Yeah. It? <laughs> it'll, it'll it, understand what, it's like, what, the, what that really is like, yeah. So, Jeff, um, of course, our manager now is Jason Tindall. And a lot of us were sort of, we weren't, we didn't really have any opinion when, uh, when he I took the number one spot because I think it was anticipated. A lot of people were suggesting a new name. Um, but I think, you know, to bed in the new manager and their coaching staff in that amount of time was probably not going to happen. And for and for continuity and squad harmony, you know, they went with JT. Um, what are your feelings, you know, so far on thing? I mean, we've had, what, you know, two matches to judge him on? Early days, isn't it? It, it is early days. I think what it feels like is it's more of a team effort. I mean, there's JT, there's Stephen Purchase, Graham Jones, the new guy, come in as well. And, and Gary, you you probably know them better than we do, more intimately than we do. Do you, do you think it's a combination that can, can work for us next season? I think Graham Jones is a really, really good addition with all his experience. Um, and I know he's been really, really popular uh, wherever he's worked. And he really, really... He really knows his stuff. I think. I think you're right. I think it, it was inevitable that Jason would get the job, um, simply because of the time factor and the continuity factor. Um, I think for, for for many people outside, it was probably a bit underwhelming um, because it, it it was almost too obvious. Um, I think it. Uh, you know, like I said, I think a lot of it's going to come down to how. Jason starts. He's going to have his own ideas, but he equally he knows the best way to work with those players. So, um, if he gets off to a good start, then then who knows? It's it's going to be difficult. It really is going to be difficult. I mean, I don't think any Cherries fan is going to underestimate a championship season because you've been there. You know what it's like. Um, I, I think Jason's going to do a really good job. I really do because he knows the guys incredibly well. Um, he knows all of their strengths. Same with Stephen Purchase, who's worked tirelessly with them on the training ground. And as I say, I think the inclusion of Graham Jones is a, is a really, really good one. Have you have you had many uh, uh, sort of liaisons with JT? I suppose most of your interviews after a match with, uh, have been with Eddie, but have you spoke to JT much, Gary? Not really, no. Um, I, remember, I remember him as a player um, <laughs> because uh, obviously, you know, that's how it all started for me in, in commentating when I was at uni. I, I was doing Bournemouth games then. Um, and I, you know, I remember those guys being around, um, you know, very intelligent guy. Um, I think, you know, a, not just a sounding board for Eddie, there was, a, there was a lot more to it than that. It was, it was, um, you know, it was a really good relationship. And I think, um, you know, everyone's going to have their own views on, on Jason's appointment. I think it's a good appointment. I think it's a very sensible and pragmatic appointment. Um, and as I say, I think, I think he'll do a very good job, you know, everyone's going to miss Eddie and that includes us in the media because, you know, he was very good to us. He was always very open and honest. Um, I could talk to him before games off air 
um, and get a feel for how he was thinking about matches. And, you know, I hope I'll be able to do that with Jason as well. Um, you know, we, 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 let's wait and see. You know, Eddie was in that job a very, very long time. You know, he was Mr. Bournemouth. And, uh, you know, it, Jason's his own man with his own ideas, as he's made very, very clear. And we're about to find out what they are. I'd just like to ask Luther. I mean, you played under some great managers, Luther. Um, what does JT have to do to live up to some of those legends, do you think? I think the biggest thing, if you're the manager or the coach of any team, is the players need to be able to trust what you say. So you need to be straight with them. One thing I've always had with the likes of Graham Taylor and Harry, and even when I was with England or whatever, they were they were straight with you. And I can, uh, you know, if you've had a bad game, Graham Taylor would come in, you know, you tell you straight, you've not had a good game and you do this, whatever. And I'd always rather that than somebody, you know, saying, going around the bushes and around the houses to say, that if I've had a bad game, I know I've had a bad game. So I just want you to come and just say, no, you're rubbish today. You need to, you need to pull your socks up, sort of thing. Um, and I think if he's honest and straight with the players, they will appreciate that and they will respond to that because they will know exactly what he's thinking at periods of games and at any time. And one of the things I, I, I found with him, tactically, I think he's very good tactically. And I thought that between him and Eddie, they, they work tactically very well because it was almost as if Eddie would be working on whatever strategy they started a game with. And and I think it's the number two job anyway, I think, because, you know, I did it with Graham. It was a case of if things aren't going right, things you'd have spoken about, and then you just remind him to say, yeah, I mean, if we're going, you know, maybe do this or whatever. Again, just to refresh things in his mind. And it was always one of those sort of relationships. And I thought their relationship was very good. And it wasn't just that sounding board. It was the decision that something that they did and they did it together because they formulated whatever plan it was for the preparation, for the game, for everything where the season was going to go. They're the ones that came up with it together. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that was important. I think, the, I think his appointment is a very good one. And I think you look at an example of Liverpool back in the day when they dominated for 10 or more years. They just, um, they, they, they promoted from within. It was somebody that knew what the club was about, what it, what, you know, what it was that made Liverpool different to everybody else. And they did that and the success just kept going every time they changed because they changed very little. They just applied their personality to what was already there. There's that saying, if it ain't broke, why change it? And I think that is something that you've got a great base, I think, at Bournemouth now with that continuity. All the players understand where they're at. They understand what is required. They know Jason and they understand even more now that he is the gaffer, that he will be even more demanding on them in certain things because he will just step up a level from where he was again to say, now, oh. this is how we're going to oh. go. I've got to ask this question because you're on. Some Bournemouth fans were talking about, let's get Nigel Pearson in. Now, you obviously know from the Watford experience what Nigel Pearson was like. Do you think he would ever have been a good fit at somewhere like Bournemouth? I think, I think Nigel would be, and I think it's important when you have the number, especially the number of British players that you have, players understand the discipline that they need to have. I think British players are better at that. That you say, this is discipline, this is it. They, uh, you draw that line in the sand and they know where it needs to be. Uh, I think um, Nigel is that sort of manager who says, right, this is what you do, basics first. And I think you need to have basics down if you're going to progress and go and do anything. Because uh, when things are going wrong, and this is something, again, that Graham was great at this, Graham Taylor, was... This is the basis of what we do everything from. Everything comes from this. So in games when things weren't going right, you literally just brought it all back in and said, right, this is where we regroup and we start again. And I think that's what Nigel was very good at. He got the players doing the basic things that made you successful. And, you know, you hear a lot of things about the modern game where people say, you know, the pressing high, they're doing this and whatever. That has been in the game forever. There's nothing new in football. They put new words to it and they change the colours of it and whatever, but there's nothing new in football, okay? And the pressing, it was something we all did. Liverpool going and using them again. Rushy, Dalglish, and then when they lost the ball, they worked and closed people down at the front. And it caused havoc because nobody was comfortable at the back with the ball like they are more so now. So they'd get more chance of scoring goals. 
So there's nothing new in it. It's just that the words have changed and people, football is a simple game. And that's how it's said and people don't really understand it. It is a simple game. Your job is to score goals at that end and stop them putting it at that end. <laughs> how can they score at that end if you're putting them in there? Yeah, very true. Very true. Now, um, just as uh, we're with you, Luther, there's been a comment that is coming from Andy Rice, who said, uh, is there any truth to the rumour that Luther Blissett's home was called Far Corf? It was. Is there any tr- <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. <That's> brilliant. <laughs> But the only, the only sad thing with that is I didn't actually give it that name. It was called that because the person that owned it before had some issue with the council, and so that was his way. Of it. <laughs> 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 when I saw the name on the stuff when it came through. I thought I've got to buy this place, and I got that. <laughs> Brilliant! Absolutely outstanding name. I think it's one of the best names I've ever seen for a hat. <laughs> Oh, absolutely love that. Well, yeah, back onto football. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns at the moment for AFC Bournemouth. I mean, JT does provide the continuity, but we don't know what he's like in competitive fixtures yet. And, you know, Gary, uh, Bournemouth fans were, as we mentioned briefly um, off air, we were overjoyed to be winning the Betway Cup. Um, Our first silverware in, what, five years as we beat West Ham uh, 5-3. And, we deployed a sort of three-four-three formation. It's a it's a yeah. lineup that's seen quite often in the Premier League with teams like sort of Man City and Wolves and the you know, teams that like to attack. Is that kind of formation seen much in the in the Championship? Do you know? Uh, I'm trying to think of the games I've covered last season. I don't remember too many teams playing um, a back three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one or two, um, but you know. A lot of the time, it's not just it's not about the systems; it's about the players, isn't it? Particularly in the championship, with with the pace and the um, the general craziness of, of the game. I don't know if Jason's going to go that way, just because it worked against um, you know the reserves of West Ham's reserves, which I think you're absolutely right about that, Jeff. Um, if he is, then it's going to be interesting um, because, as, as we say, there aren't many other teams doing it. Um, but then again, you know, he wants to exploit the pace in that in that team, particularly down the flanks, because it's so important in the championship. So, so let's see, let's see that first game. Um, let's see how he lines up. What we knew about Eddie was that he would line up one way and then change it mid game, um, sometimes twice. Um, he wasn't afraid to be tactically flexible, and I'm sure you know Jason has seen that that. Um, can work. So, so let's see. I, I I wouldn't like to say that's going to be Bournemouth's nailed on formation for the whole season because a lot of the time it's horses for courses as well. You know, the opposition comes into into play too. Um, I think you know you need to look at who's available and, and find the system that's best for them. Um, and as you know, sometimes it didn't always work with three at the back for Bournemouth when I saw them. So, who knows? It may work this season. And would you say, Gary, that, that teams in the Premier League are, uh, seem to feel more comfortable letting the opposition have the ball and it's probably going to be more uh, harsh realities of football in the Championship where, as Luther said, everyone's going to be closing down, it's going to be very much more much more physical and, I don't know, maybe that will suit the way we play because when we had a lot of the ball last season, we didn't do much with it, did we? Lots of possession, but in non-threatening areas. Um, that was too, too much of Bournemouth's play last season when I when I saw them. Um, what I've seen from many championship games I cover is that you have a side dominating possession and the opposition will score late on and win 1-0. I've seen that so, so many times in the championship. Um, such a brutal division. We know that set plays are even more important in the championship than in the, the Premier League. And that's somewhere with something that Bournemouth have been absolutely brilliant at, even in this relegation season. I, I think they scored the most goals from set plays in the whole league. Um, so, you know, it's important that they keep that up as well. They show a great amount of imagination from their set plays. And I think that's going to be critical uh, this season to keep that up. Um, so, yeah, that, that, you know, that there's a lot of impon- uh, ponderables, a lot of unknowns. Um, and like I keep saying, I, I just think it's so important to get off to a good start, not even performance wise, just to get those points on the board and, and get yourself up the table straight away. Yeah. Because uh, only because, but that's what we've seen in recent history the sides that start well go up. Mm. 
Yeah, well, we'll be wrapping up very shortly. But um, Luther, I just, you know, obviously, I've just been sort of looking through your career. And when I started, uh, you know, watching, you know, Bournemouth as a lad, you know, you were banging them in in the sort of late um, 80s. I mean, you were in the first division with Watford and then the second division you were with in the second and third for then Bournemouth, Watford, West Brom, etc. Do, do you think the second tier is, uh, I mean, I know it's changed sort of more recently, but do you think it's a division that's more sort of, you know, connected with the realities of football rather than the Premier League. Absolutely, the the Premier League is is almost it is that fantasy league because when you look at the players that we now have playing in that division, and you see you see the likes of Man City and you see Liverpool. I mean, I watched a lot of Liverpool last season. Went up there and even watched them live a number of times. And they are, you know, but most of the time you think to yourself they are just on another planet because they just go and then suddenly they hit you and you're you know you're one two down in no time at all the way they play the game. And City's the same, and Chelsea, and you've got Manchester United and all of those teams up there. So it, it, is, it is almost a fantasy league, of the, the Premier League. The Championship is what I remember the first division before it became the Premier League was all about, where, yes, there was a couple of teams that were maybe a bit special, but generally, if you went out and gave your all and did things in the right way, you can get a result against pretty much everybody. And that has continued, and I love that. That's what I love about the, the championship. You don't get games where it's a given that you go there and you're going to win. You know, you could be the team at the top, we're playing the team at the bottom, and you could get beat two or three nil. And people go, how can that happen? Because you cannot afford to go there and thinking, yeah, we'll just swap these to one side, because it doesn't happen. In the championship, you have to be on it every game. And that, yeah. I think, is a crucial thing. That is, that is huge about what the game you know, what playing in this league now is all about. And I think yeah. I look at what Jason's done and the fact that you mentioned there that, yes, Eddie used to change things during the game. Mourinho, Mourinho was one of the first that openly did it when he came to, to Chelsea. He would start the game and if it wasn't going right, if he had to take a couple of players off, or do that, he would do it. Didn't, didn't care. Mm. You know, and I think too many people leave it, leave it. In my time when I've been... You know, especially when I took the reserve team at Watford when we first got in the Premier League back in 99. Um, I I did that. I'd set the team up one way, but we'd have rehearsed another way of playing if things weren't going right. And we just change it, you know, and then we could change back. And I think it's important that your team are able to do that because periods of the game, whether you lose players to injury or the other the opposition are better on the day than what you are in certain areas, you have to adapt. I think that's the biggest thing, spotting it early enough and making a change so you can combat that to give you that base so you can then turn the tables on them. And, and I think it's a fascinating. I don't think that's going to be an issue with um, at all with, with Jason on this at all. I think that is something they worked on together and that's going to still be a part of, I think, all the way Bournemouth do their stuff. And uh, there's, I think there are going to be a few more clubs playing with, um, with three at the back this season. I just get that feeling that they're going to be doing that. I've seen Watford do it and... Um, and what we're thinking about, and this coach, he used to do it, he did it when he was in Israel anyway. He did it quite often, changed from that, and then sometimes played a 4 3 3 or, or a version of the 4 2 4 or whatever. You know, he, he, he chopped it about a bit. So it's going to be an intriguing season how it's going to go, but starting well is huge. Huge yeah. starting well. You can I get think, them points on the board. I think one of the other things that JT is going to have to deal with is. Uh, emerging from Eddie's shadow, if you like. And and there's been a lot of talk already, Gary, about Eddie's legacy at Bournemouth, you know, the training ground, new facilities, which are still not in place. Um, could you argue that, that some of the signings that he made created a bit of a, an unwanted financial legacy? You know, we've spent a lot of money on players. We've shipped a few out, admittedly. But where do you, where do you, where do you stand on, on that sort of transfer record? Well, obviously, the players that have left in this window have gone for huge profit. So that's, you know, that's that's basically covered the losses from relegation. If you add in the parachute payments, that money's now you know, back back level again, which is why you're starting to see bids going in for other players. They bid a million pounds for Caden Jackson, didn't they, um, this week? And I think, you know, they, they will still be looking for another striker. You know, 
Brooks for eleven and a half million pounds, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, one of the biggest bargains ever. Um, and I think you know, if there are Premier League clubs looking at Brooks and thinking they might pinch him, it's going to take an enormous bid um, for Bournemouth to sell. Now that they've sold those three players and, and made that profit, um, you know, I still think Lewis Cook is a, fa- a fantastic bargain. There was a question mark over that signing for a very long time, but I just think he's got better and better and better, and I think he'll be an enormous influence in the in the Championship this season. So actually, although Eddie got quite a lot of stick. Um, from outside for some of the transfer um, dealings that he did. When you when you analyse it, you know every team makes mistakes, but actually he's I think he's got way more right than wrong, and he's got them at, at very good prices a lot of the time as well. And you know p- people throw Solanke into that mix. Let's see what he does this season. You know it didn't happen for him until the very end of uh, of last season, but what I saw. I liked when he started scoring goals and I, I think he'll do it in the championship. I really do. Uh, just a couple more questions for you, Gary. Then we'll uh, come over to Luther to end. Firstly, Kerry Phillips on chat saying, how is Gary's arm not aching? Holding that <laughs> uh, I, I'm swapping <laughs> hands every so often. I oh, wow, even not, noticing. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't even realise that. I, I've got to say now, it, um, in terms of uh, being a commentator and in the media, Gary, Whilst there's obviously a football difference in the Premier League between that and the EFL Championship, in terms of the media scrutiny and the amount of hustle and bustle on a match day, what do you find is the difference between a team in the Prem and you know a team like us now in the Championship? Yeah, I mean, it is it is very different. The Premier League has its own set of rules. And it, when you get promoted, you, you're given a, a booklet that thick of regulations, um, which you have to follow. And clubs actually end up spending an enormous amount of money just fulfilling those regulations. I think um, it, the championship is so, so different in so many ways. You get less time to stew on a defeat as a team because there's always a game coming up a few days later. Premier League is often Saturday to Saturday. And sometimes you may even have eight or nine days between a game. Championship, totally different. You just have to move on straight away. And that that can be a huge, huge positive. Um, You get an awful lot of smash and grabs. Like I said, you 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 get a lot of unexpected defeats and, and undeserved defeats as well. And they can be massive for confidence. So... Um, I think it's a completely different division. I love working on the championship because you never, ever get a dull game. You might get a nil-nil, but it's never dull. Um, I've certainly yet to do a championship game that I come away from thinking, well, that was terrible. Sometimes it might not be the best quality, but there's always that pace and excitement. Um, And sadly, the crowds are such a big, big part of it in the championship. And again, I go back to feeling really depressed that we're starting a season with no fans. Um, As a commentator, I'm just devastated about that. And I just pray that it changes sooner rather than later. So, Luther, I've got two questions for you that that have been uh, sent in. Morgan says, uh, would you come out of retirement to play next season? And Ethan says, what was your favourite Bournemouth goal? So I guess they're both connected, really. They are. I think... um... Would I get my boots and I come out and play? Yeah, I would, but don't expect me to be running around. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just. I would just now be that midfield player or play the number ten role, just sitting behind and just get the ball and knock it around and wait for my moment. I think of what I do. Um, I talk. You talk about. Um, I suppose when you talk about uh, goals, I alluded earlier on to you know the way you lull people into into a false sense of security defenders of where you are. I remember we played um, up at Crewe and uh, I think we ended up beating them 3-0 or 3-1 or something. Um, and my, I think it was the second goal. I scored it on, it was our left side of the box and it was a, it was a free kick. Was it a free kick or was it open play? It was a free kick which we took short and it was Brooks gave it to Bishop and he's the one that played it in. And it was, it was one of those things because I wanted the space behind the centre half and if you're going to use the space, you've got to you've got to somewhere move him. So what I did, I moved him into a position that he was comfortable in. And all I did was, as the ball was moved, I just made that run as if I was going to go in front of him. He made it as they do; they react first, and he went there, and I just pulled off behind him, and the ball came diving across his shoulder. I did one touch and put it away. And it was it was that's the sort of thing that because we worked on that. You know, I remember first day training, and um, you know. I, I just, <laughs> we had a little practice match type thing 
and I would make him, and then I've got the ball. And so I let them know very nicely. No, it wasn't very nicely at all. Because <laughs> you, have to, you have to tell people my thing as a striker. I my my thing I was brought up when you want the ball, you want the ball. Not when you're finished banging around with it. I want the ball when I want it, where I want it. And if I cock it up, hold me hand up, I did it. But give me the service that I demand. And we've spoken about it to the players, you know, and I say to them, look, when I do that and I do that and I walk in and do that, and as I do that, play it in and I'll get it behind it. And, you know, there were things that we worked on and it worked an absolute treat that day when we did it. And so that was that was one of my favourite goals. That Very one. good. Do you know, I think Sam Davis modelled his game on yours, Luther, the way you described yeah, it. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> I absolutely wish. I've got to say a uh, final question. Whatever happened to Luther Blissett Sports in Hold Nurse Road? Hey, got rid of that. We're just chucking money away. You <laughs> 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 don't chuck so much away, then you think it's, you know, it's time to bin it. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Well, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure tonight. Um, I want to say best wishes for the season with all your media work and fingers crossed we'll be there to join you in the ground. But, like you know, like another uh, famous commentator said, I hope you can soak it up and drink it in and I'm, I'm sure you'll be mm -hmm. doing your utmost to uh, convey the atmosphere to us as the season goes on. So, uh, Gary Taphouse, thank you so much for coming on. Lovely to be here. Nice to speak to you guys. Lovely to speak to you, Luther, as well. Very a pleasure. Always a pleasure, sir. We will, we will speak and we will end up in a stadium again very soon. <laughs> I'm sure you will. And also, uh, Luther Blissett, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much, guys. Tell you what, when we play, because I think Watford play Bournemouth in about five games' time, don't we? Is it five yes, games? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. I think so. When we do that one, I'll be, I'll probably almost certainly be doing it on a, um, on a watch along with some fans and some other people. One of you guys, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure we make contact and we can have a, have a Zoom during the game and after the game or whatever and have a chat about it, yeah? Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds good. All right, Brilliant. nice one. Thank you very much. Thank that was uh, yeah. Gary. Seriously, good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Really Cheers, appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, Luther Blissett and uh, Gary Taphouse there joining us. And, um, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant to have them along, Jeff, wasn't it? And um, it's, it's going to be a very interesting season for AFC Bournemouth, isn't it? Um, Blackburn Rovers at the weekend. We'll do a you know, five-minute, uh, five, ten-minute preview on that. Um, uh, but beforehand, we just wanted to talk about the Forest Home Hospice. As mentioned, uh, over the last couple of months, we've been raising money for Forest Home, a charity that's close to our, our hearts. Uh, they care for those with life-limiting illnesses in Paul and surrounding areas with end-of-life and palliative care. Their team care for over 1,000 patients each year, both at home, in hospital and in the hospice. Now, uh, of course, Harry Redknapp, he got behind it, didn't he? By, uh, well, he's going to be doing a round of golf with um, with Tony Funnel and Chris Root was the winner of that competition and we raised, uh, yeah, over £2,000. So if you did want to donate some money as a thank you to us for what we're doing here really just a few quid um afcbpodcast.com slash fundraiser that's afcbpodcast.com slash fundraiser as that's going to be closing very soon so jeff mm. blackburn rovers um this is our preview now this is you know this is time to preview it um it's mad isn't it it seemed to have come around so quickly i would have swore that we were supposed to be doing three friendlies but alas we've only had two uh, mm. and on saturday i do get the feeling that blackburn are giving up are probably going to give us a much stiffer test than what west ham did i think so i mean they've had a carabao cup game already so they've you know they've had a, a probably arguably a tougher pre-season than we have even though we played benfica and west ham um they were a mid-table side, probably underperformed a little bit last season. You know, they're a, they're a big club. They've got uh, some talent there. You know, they're not going to be a pushover. But I, I, I've got a feeling that we're, we're going to go into this game playing quite aggressively attacking football. And I don't know. I've got a feeling that we could see our old Bournemouth back. 
Well, it certainly felt like that in the match against West Ham, didn't it? That free-flowing football that, you know, was reckless because we did concede a couple of goals. But it's a case of what Kirk Tovey said on one of the recent shows, that it's the fact that we're going to be playing a brand of football whereby we score more than you. And if that's the case, it's going to be entertaining for us, albeit we're watching at home. But um, I mean, I would take that. And there are teams that can be punished in the Championship. And surely to goodness... We should be seeing that kind of high scoring football yet again, because our attacking impetus is, albeit without Callum Wilson, without Ryan Fraser, maybe even without Josh King, it still seems to be there, doesn't it? Well, the the attacking potential we've got within the team, you know, just just even if we don't mention David Brooks, Dan Juma and Stanislas would have looked pretty good the last two games. In fact, arguably with Stan in the team last season in more games, we would have done better than we did. You know, I think he's he's been underrated by um, by other Premier League teams, you know, that they haven't looked at picking him up, probably because of his injury record. He is a very good player. He's very skillful. He'll create chances. And then when you think, well, if Solanke does start finding the back of the net, as he did in those last few games, you know, he's a, he looks a different player. He, he looks actually... The player that we we bought we bought so long ago, and I don't know. It just feels that there's a. It's going to be, it's going to be a different mentality from the team when they go out on that pitch. They won't be thinking, you know, let's try and nick it and win one nil and hang on, which we failed to do so many times last season. It will be, you know, let's go out and let's bang in three or four and and see if they can score five. Hmm. So should we do this then? As our preview, we'll do the team that we expect to be fielding at the weekend. And I mean, it looks like Travis is going to be in goal. I wonder if this will differ from what um, we did on another video earlier. But um, obviously, it was ba- it was always going to be changed based on the team news that uh, we would hear throughout the week. So, yeah, we'll start with Travis in goal because that looks you know, very much likely. But then in terms of the formation, Jeff, I mean... Are we going to go with the, I say tried and trusted, it, it didn't work for us in Project Lockdown, the 4-4-2, or, or, you know, go with what we've enjoyed in the past week or so? Yeah, I think he's going to go 3-4-3. Three, three. Um, mm. I think he's going to go with the, the, the three at the back being Steve Cook. Yeah. Lloyd Kelly. Yeah. And probably... Diego Rico, would it be? Yeah, Diego Rico, I think... Probably instead of someone like Chris Meppham. Yeah, it would probably be Rico, I think. You know, or he puts Meppham in there as well because Kelly's obviously, you know, you know, left footed, left sided. So he might maybe put Cook, Meppham and Kelly in there. That you know, that's yeah. the only thing I can think of. But Rico, I I, just, I don't know. I just I thought he did really well in that match against West Ham. So part of me thinks it'd probably be Rico on the left and you know Kelly in the middle because he's the player that we need to start really building our team around. To be honest, um, yeah. at the back that is. Um, so I mean, if we did do that, that obviously then puts the four uh, in midfield. And well, you know, who are we going to go for in midfield? Would it be a repeat of what we saw at the London Stadium? Uh, so I, I think it probably will be. Uh, Cook and uh, Stacey, uh, Smith and Stacey, rather, actually. Yeah, yeah uh, Smith and Stacey, yeah, agreed with that. And then in the centre, so, yeah, I think probably Cook and Lerma. Yeah, I think. I'm on board with that. Um, I think, you know, it's... You know, Dan Gosling has has certainly got a place in the team, but I think he can only work with certain individuals. And, you know, same with Lewis Cook. I, I don't think you'd have a midfield whereby Billing would be alongside Cook because they're not box to box. You sort of wonder sometimes what they do. But what they did do, uh, you went alongside their perfect partners, i.e. when Philip uh, Billing was alongside Dan Gosling. I thought he complimented him really well and it worked. Same with Lewis Cook, you know, with Lerman. Lewis Cook seemed to have you know, the license that he needs. Sometimes he's been quite deep, but he fizzed a, a brilliant through ball to uh, Stanislas to create our goal to make it 3-2 because Stanislas picked it up. He put in Billing and then Solanke, you know, all that stuff. Dan Gosling scored it. But I thought he was, you know, really good back there. Um, and, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing a player that, you know, notoriously always thrived in the Championship. In the Premier League, 
wasn't really so effective for us, was he? Indeed. And I think Lewis Cook is better when he's not in that rigid 4 4 2. You know, I, I think he he struggles where he's playing with the holding midfielder like Lerma and it's just him in there. I think he he doesn't quite he doesn't quite do that. He doesn't have enough kind of other players to bounce off around him in that formation. So I think the three four three is is much better suited to that. And then uh, you know, Josh King, we don't know if he's gonna go or not. Um but would he be a player that's risked and how would that be any different to Ryan Fraser if they're protecting him or he's protecting yeah. himself? Uh, you sort of think in, in, in that, I don't know. But I think he's probably going to go for the three that started against West Ham, don't you think? Yeah, I I think so. I mean, it, it depends. So Brooks... Uh, is, of course, Brooks. It's, forgot about him. Yeah. Is, is Brooks, did Brooks play for Wales? I, I know he joined the he squad, did. but... Yeah, he did. Um, he played in their last uh, match. They won it 1-0 at home. I, I thought he was all right. Uh, but still, I haven't seen enough from him in a Bournemouth shirt recently. I mean, I know it was very unprecedented, unique circumstances in lockdown, but we all pinned our hopes on him and he and he wasn't one of our best players. Um, so, so I think you've got to pick two from three. You've got to pick uh, Stanislas Brooks, Dan Juma. It's two of those three. And yeah. Solanke's got to lead the, lead the line. because I mean, even though Josh King played a bit for Norway, I saw the other night, you know, he hasn't trained with the team. I don't even know if he's in the country yet, do you? Yeah. I know, uh, No, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be King. And it's just a case of, you know, maybe Stanislas will be put on the bench and maybe it'll be Dan Juma and Brooks, perhaps. Maybe I've gone a bit too soon by putting Stanislas in there. Um, yeah. It, yeah. it seems to be two from three, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so, and and I think it's probably going to be. Uh, I'll, I'd say Dan Juma deserves it on his preseason playing. You know, he's he's been the star player in both games, arguably. So, whichever is the is going to be giving us more than forty five minutes, Stanislas or Brooks, who's going to last sixty, probably. Yeah, and it'd probably be a swap to the other way around as well because Dan Juma was really effective down there, you know, left. And then uh, either Stan Slass or Brooks on the right and then, you know, Solanke up front and he's the one we are pinning our goal hopes on. So, yeah. Um, do you know much about Blackburn Rovers, Jeff? Honestly, not not much at all. You know, I, I, I confess, I didn't watch much of the Championship last season. So, you know, what, we, what, we, what can we expect? Uh, they finished mid table. Um, they're not. They're not an impoverished club. Not totally impoverished. They they must have some good players to finish mid table in the championship, and that probably is a little bit undercooked in terms of where they should be for a, yeah. a club that size. But honestly, it's you know this is this is the dangerous thing. All these sides are going to be unknown, not just yeah. to us, but to the players, to the to the coaching staff, and um, yeah. We're going to have to wake up and figure him out pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think it's important that JT starts off, you know, very confidently and very strong. Um, otherwise, you know, there there were some people that weren't overly happy with his appointment, and I'm sure they'll take uh, that as bait to, uh, you know, get on his back as soon as possible. That you know, it seems like people who've got um, a negative opinion about him are just almost waiting to pounce. Um, so there we go. That is what we think it will be starting lineup against Blackburn Rovers. So in order to watch the match, if you're in the UK, you can do so on AFCB TV Live. It's a brand new system that they brought in. All you need to do is go to live.afcb.co.uk. And I signed up earlier and it worked an absolute treat, I've got to say. Um, it was an easy payment process. Um, it was very quick and easy to book my match ticket. It's £10 a match. And someone on the chat says, I think it was Paul, and says, is that worth it? Well, that money goes straight to the club. And if you're thinking you're going to do illegal streams um, over the next, you know, 46 uh, match weeks, you'll be very disappointed at the lack of streams that will be on there. Um, so this is your best bet uh, to watching the games. And like I said, the money does go uh, direct to the club. But yeah, once you go to live.afcb.co.uk, 
you'll see something like this. I've already reserved uh, my match ticket already. Um, but what you'll have is a red button there that says, you know, buy match pass or something like that. Mine says watch live already. But yeah, you click that and then you can go through the checkout process. And then when you come back to the screen afterwards, if you press refresh, it will say match parts pass purchased or watch live and then you're all good to go. Now, one thing you can't actually do is cast from the app. If you're if you're using on your phone, you can't actually cast from the video on the web player or also on um, you know your iPad or whatever directly to your TV. But if you're watching through a desktop with Chromecast, you can cast your browser tab. And if you can do that, then you can cast it to the TV. But under EFL restrictions, you're not supposed to. But either way, it's just an HDMI cable. Are you looking forward to the game, Jeff? Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, very much so. I, I feel like uh, this is a season where we should, ought to, will win more than 10 games in the season. We're going to look beyond 40 points, upwards 50, upwards 60, upwards even higher. So... Yeah, and it feels that we can do that with some sense of realism and perspective this season. You know, um, what, it's up to the players to put a shift in, get some results on the board early on, and uh, yeah, let's let's get some momentum going. Yeah, and if there were ever any complacent characters in the AFC Bournemouth side, maybe those players have gone now um or will be on their way now apparently according to uh james who's in the chat uh josh uh king is has been given permission by ac bournemouth to stay in norway and will miss the start of the season so uh there we go there'll be no king so i think it's that formation and then stanislas or, or brooks i'm looking forward to it hope you're looking forward to it at home remember Whilst we can't go to the games, we'll be doing our full-time free-for-alls after the final whistle on the hour, so at five o'clock on Saturday. Um, we will be here only for about an hour or so. We won't go overboard, but yeah, please come on and have your say. I'll be joined by Jeff for the podcast, which is out on Monday morning. There'll be a video version also on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And remember, hit the thumbs up button as well, because that really helps us get this video noticed. And with two legends, one a goal scoring legend and one a commentate legend in the uh, chat tonight, um, then hopefully, uh, hopefully the video will get quite a lot of exposure. Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure once again, my friend. Yeah, same to you, Sam. And, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, to catching up after Saturday. We will do up the cherries. Up the we'll cherries see you in the next video. Yeah. Oh,